Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Can you guys hear me okay? Sure. Do I need this? No. Thank you. Okay. Just one more thing to carry around with me. Thank you. I want to thank the League of Women Voters for putting this on. As was mentioned, I didn't have an open forum. Um, nobody wanted to play with me, I guess, uh, when I ran, which in a lot of ways was unfortunate. It was unfortunate for me through my lens because I've always enjoyed open forums. Um, I've had two of them running for council contested. Uh, and it's always that period in time when you really get to lay out the way you, you think, the, what you believe in, what you want to do. So again, I, I'm grateful to the league for putting this on tonight. Um, I'm also grateful to my staff for coming here today. Thank you all. It's my, my uh, cheering section, and they're the ones who are going to look at me funny if I say something wrong. Um, the, I want to also thank my wife for being here. She's been, uh, she has been by me through thick and thin. Um, she's my confidant. I share a lot with her. Uh, she uh, often advises me. Um, you might think that I was writing down some notes. It was actually the grocery list for tonight since we're so close to Kroger. That's not true. Um, my twins, who often keep me on my toes and keep me sharp and on point, uh, sometimes good, sometimes bad. You know, the good is funny when they're sitting at the dining room table at night talking about my experience throughout the day and all they want to do is have potty talk because they're four years old and they think it's really funny. <laughs> or worse yet, when they came home when, from school one day, only for us to find out from their teachers that for whatever reason, one of my daughters thought it was okay to look at their teacher and say, I don't have to put these blocks away. My daddy's the mayor. <laughs> I didn't teach them that. <laughs> and finally, I want to thank all of you um, for coming. Again, like I said, for me, um, I have had people come to me and said, you know, are you a little bit nervous about tonight because there will be a mic roaming around and people can ask questions, which is unlike an open forum. For those of you who've been to open forums, it's usually vetted notes, um, uh, you know, issues and whatnot that come forward. This is very different. Um, and my answer to that was, no, I'm not, because this is what community engagement is all about. I am the mayor of the city, but I am here to serve you. You know, I'm not in it for myself. Um, I am taking a, pay, taking a pay cut uh, to become the mayor, which is a good thing in my mind. It's because it's something I want to do. It's something when Paul Weil finally said to me, he said, you know, I'm really thinking that I'm not going to run again. Um, and I said, you know, it, you having said that, I would like to run for mayor. And he looked at me and he said, I think that you would make a fine mayor if you did decide to run. Uh, and it was at that moment where I really jumped in with both feet and said, you know what? I'm going to do this because um, I think I can do it well. Um, <clears throat> to give you a little bit of vision as to how I see things in the city over my first four years um, is, and some of you know this, you've heard about this, I'm sure, in that you know I've got some some you know uh, a vision for certain things. I certainly have a vision for the Armory, um, which is you know one of our. It's one of our heritage places. You know, it has been here since 1914. We've had warriors go to war and not come back. We've had warriors who went to war and did come back, um, but may have come back uh, not as whole people, which is often the case with, with combat. Um, combat's a horrible thing, but it's a necessary thing in a lot of cases for the, the, the protection of our, our country. Um, but that said, I see the armory becoming possibly a, uh, a multi-use space, I mean, it could be a number of different things, but, but I've been working hard with our city planner, I've been also, we put together two years, almost three years ago, an ad hoc committee that's looking at what can the armory be brought to life, back to life as. Uh, so we've been exploring that a lot. I've mentioned this as well, I think uptown area, it's time, it's time to do a regentrification of the uptown area. I see West Union, the fire that took place, um, that uh, was extremely unfortunate, uh, on one hand because it was loss of property, but it was also, we were real fortunate and in large part thanks to both our, our fire department, our police department, Nelsonville Fire Department, the Plains Fire Department uh, in terms of saving lives, no loss of life in that fire. Thank goodness that that didn't happen. But with that fire, we as a city have learned to, to 
modify our driving <laughs> in terms of West Union. Uh, we've only had one lane of traffic and one site of parking for a year and two months, three months now. And so I kind of see an opportunity here to where we can create possibly a green space or a plaza of some type um, and retain it to the one lane of traffic and one side of parking and maybe open it up as, as kind of a, a real interesting gathering space. Um, I think it's time to start rethinking a lot of the uptown area. Another thing I've been working on is the possibility of having a special improvement district uh, in the uptown area, which will afford us to redo a lot of the Court Street, possibly you know Washington, Carpenter, State Street, um, Union for uh, kind of again bringing it back to life in a little bit different way. Plan, you know, thinking about changing the streetscape. Certainly, making some infrastructure repairs, uh, not just repairs, but um, something that uh, that Andy Stone brought to light for me um, through Dana McDaniel's, the city manager for Dublin, is the possibility of putting you know fiber optics in anything that we any street repair that we create where we've got to do some major construction. Um, we already put conduit up and down Richland Avenue with the Richland Avenue repair that at some point we could start running fiber optics. Um, so we're you know, starting to explore a number of those things uh, in terms of re in infrastructure improvements. Um, the, the levy, and I'm sure a lot of you are here tonight to, to ask questions about the levy. Um, well, I'm referring to the Arts, Parks, and Recreation levy. Um, again, I thank the citizens for passing that levy um, for a number of reasons. Yes, our pool is 40 years old, it's aging, um, and it's in dire need of being replaced. But you know, so are ADA improvements throughout the rest of the city parks, um, as well as this building, Arts West and whatnot, and that levy allows for that. It allows for making park improvements. Um, you know, in terms of playground equipment, you know, one of my favorite parks is one of those that's really kind of off the radar sometimes, which is Highland Park. Highland Park needs some, some help, um, and Highland Park is on the radar uh, for changes taking place. Um, Sells Park is another example of a beautiful space, um, you know, that we can, we can work on. But certainly, like I said, the community center, the swimming pool, and some other features going on too. Some pretty simple things. Day one, when I came into office, um, I kind of laid it out there, since we are public servants, we're all, my staff is all public servants. We're here for the citizenry of the, of the city of Athens. And so customer service became one of my key things. It's like, we need to change the way we interact with the public when they come in and they're, they're having to deal with this issue or that issue or pay their utilities or wherever, we can do a better job of how we serve and we, we interface with the community via customer service, that we're there to listen, respond, and get back to you in a timely fashion. And if we don't know the answer, the answer is, well, I don't know. You might want to check with so-and-so. And I've said, you know, we will find an answer as, you know, to whatever the question is. It may take a little time, but we will find the answer. So, so, so some simple changes. Um, some other simple changes that have already occurred in my all of, I don't know, three weeks in office is, you know, getting an ADA switch on the second set of glass doors as you come into the city building to where now if you are in need of some assistance to get through, that switch is there to be able to activate the second set of doors and then you can come through and pay your water bill or ask a question. We're gonna get a lift in the city building pretty soon so that people can come back and visit me in my office instead of the other way around where we'll get a lift that's in the city building to go up that flight of five steps um, that a lot of you are familiar with um, to where We'll get a lift that isn't sitting right there by the steps, but a little hallway that you go around, take a lift, you go up five steps, and you can continue on and do business back where all of you know, the large part of my city staff is. Transportation, um, this, is a, this is a little bit bigger, um, but I'm, I'm telling you this because I want you to know my level of engagement, how I view this role, the role that I have taken on as being the mayor, um, and that is that 
when, as a council member, when we worked with Michael Lockman of Athens Public Transit, when he pitched to us, he goes, I'd like to try a trial run to where our bus now goes from Athens to Chansey, you know, because I think there's a need. He was right. Uh, ridership on that particular route alone has gone up a lot. I've engaged with the city council members while I was still a city council member, and I was still engaged with the city manager, um, the mayor, as well as council in Nelsonville. I'd like to see a bus line on a regular basis that goes between the city of Athens and Nelsonville. You know, if you think about it, as I do, things like the Nelsonville Music Festival, which draws a large crowd, um, a lot of those individuals end up staying in the Athens hotels, but they're driving their cars back and forth and having to park. If we can create transportation that would alleviate the number of cars that are out there on the road, that's a good thing. The other thing I often think about is jobs, you know, uh, for making reliable transportation that may not have to be a car that you may not be able to pay the fuel bill for to go back and forth. A bus would be a great alternative if it's two dollars or whatever, whatever the fee is to ride. I also think of the children. I think of kids in Nelsonville that could be, um, uh, that could easily come to Athens during the summer and get involved in kids on campus if it only costs them 50 cents one way or something like that. Come into Athens, enjoy what's going on here because otherwise, you know, a family may not be able to afford to, you know, to to drive that child back and forth. And again, it's reducing the amount of vehicles and carbon emissions that we're seeing on the roads just, just between us and Nelsonville. I think it's prudent to explore that. Again, that's also asking Nelsonville, you gotta play with us. You know, the city of Athens isn't going to subsidize what you're doing out there, but let's, let's work. We can figure this out together and they're willing to engage. And so we've got a long ways to go on that, but something that I'm earnestly looking into um, and really want to see that come to fruition um, Sometime soon, I would hope. Um, travel. <laughs> I, I didn't mean, I just jotted down travel. I'm not going to talk to you about my trips, my vacations, and I don't have any. I was told as mayor, you can't leave the city of Athens. <laughs> um, I... I believe the role of the mayor of Athens is you're the chief ambassador for this city as well, you know. And with that, something that I have really enjoyed doing over the past four years as a city council member, and I'm going to do moving forward, is attending things like the International Town Gown Association Conference to where you sit down and go to, to sessions or whatever, and you're interacting with other city council members, other mayors, other university presidents uh, and administration, and you're sitting there you know, having talks back and forth to see how other people are, are dealing with very similar issues. And there's a lot of really cool things that come out of these, these conferences. Um, I've told my staff, uh, Paula Mosley, my service safety director, um, who's my know everything person, um, she, um, I mean in terms of history, uh, <laughs> some things I haven't told Paula, believe me, <laughs> nor would she want to know, um, um, is that, you know, and she has gone to ITGA, International Town Gown Association, and she knows the value in it, but I'd, you know, I'd like other city staff to, to come to these as well as city council members to attend, and Chris Nisley, uh, the president of council, who's here tonight, and I forgot to introduce you, so the city council member is here, president of council, but Chris Nisley has been to these as well, and knows the value in, in what goes on. National League of Cities, which I just attended um, back in November. It was in, in Nashville, and it was really interesting. I know this is kind of a hot button topic, but it's worth mentioning and sharing with you is that I went to, among other sessions, at the National League of Cities, it's, it's basically mayors um, that are there uh, interacting with each other, but also city council members. Um, there's 4,000 people who attend that conference, which is a huge body of people. And it's mostly talking about legislative actions and things that are going on within your municipalities, as well as you know, streetscape improvements, you know, how they went about finding funding to do X, Y, and Z. But one of the things that came up was this interesting conference, or this interesting session and it had to do with the Airbnb issue. Um, and it was fascinating to sit, and for me, as a, as, uh, at that time, um, a brand new mayor-elect, 
that conference started on November 5th and the election was November 4th now. Um, and so I'm walking around still kind of like, oh yeah, I'm the mayor or mayor elect. But t listening to other cities, and it was really interesting, it was one of the aldermen from, from Nashville who was sitting there talking about the implications of non-owner occupied Airbnbs in their city. And so it was fascinating to listen to this whole dialogue taking place and listening to other mayors, you know, with their concerns, um, but also solutions. So it's not just everyone coming with problems, but people coming with some really interesting creative solutions. So I learned a lot from that. My, my point with bringing that up is that, <clears throat> I, again, as mayor, I, I believe it's vitally important to, to, to kind of my own CEUs, um, continuing education, is to go and attend these types of things, uh, these conferences. I'll, I'll be going in March, as a matter of fact, to the, the uh, National League of Cities where the mayors meet with uh, lobbyists and whatnot and figure out how things are going, what bills are coming through Congress and so on and so forth. So I'm looking forward to that coming up pretty soon. But again, like, that's part of what I see this role being, is that I need to continually learn, see what other people are doing, but also, I am, I am the face of Athens when I'm going to these places, and I think it's important for me to be there because I'm constantly selling this city. This city, to me, I rolled into Athens back in 1998. A lot of you probably know that, but for those of you who don't, I came here in 1998, and it was the most <laughs> interesting drive from Pittsburgh, I came in down 50, back when 50 was just two lanes, um, and uh, the new split lane, you know, highway hadn't been put in yet. And I remember tooling along, driving through, going, I've never been, I've never been down there. I don't know anything about this part of Ohio. I barely knew what Columbus was. Um, but I, I remember driving in, and I come down 50, and I'm swinging around the river here, looking across, this is in April, and seeing this white spires, and seeing this, these brick buildings, and I sat there from that point on in my vehicle driving the rest of the way. I hadn't even interviewed yet. And I'm sitting there plotting, how in the world am I going to be able to come here to live? Um, it's one of those at first sight kinds of things. Um, someone was just asking me the other day, and they said, well, you know, did you think at the time that, you know, did the city have the accoutrements that you needed? You know, was there, were those the right stores here and whatever? And <laughs> honestly, I didn't care. I really didn't. It was just, I was sold at first sight. That's what I kind of convey when I'm going to these conferences and trying to get people to know what we're all about as a community, as a city. Um, to share this with you as well, this also deals with traveling. Today alone, um, I had an early 9 o'clock meeting um, and tour of the armory up in Columbus on Main and 2nd. Um, and it was, I was blown away. I was fascinated by it. I wanted to figure out how their Arts, Parks, and Rec manages this armory for the arts, and it falls under the city. And it's like I'm sitting there looking at the way they've done this and, and trying taking down as many notes as I possibly can. And then from there, I hopped in my truck and drove on up to Mansfield, Ohio, because I met with Mayor Theaker of Mansfield for a specific reason. They have put together teamed up with the county's DD board and they have put in a cafe in their city building that is a training center for individuals living with disabilities to learn culinary arts and food services who they've spun off out of this, I was told, over 10 people who graduated and now are working in the food industry throughout the city of Mansfield who have kind of graduated from this. But again, it was a true you know, public partner, uh, private partnership to where they work together to create this, this, uh, this amazing space. Um, I, I'll show you the pictures, but my screen is this big. Um, th there's, I took tons of pictures, and it's this really upscale, cool restaurant experience. Um, but it's serving, I think, for, through my lens, um, for, the, for the better good of all of their citizenry, and in particular, those living with disabilities, giving them some meaningful employment um, and also encouraging them to spin off and start their own businesses or go work for somebody else. And, and they're, they're a huge success story. So again, I was scribbling down notes left and right trying to figure out, how do you do this? You know, what's the agreement that you've got you know, with the DD board and the city um, as well as um, what's called uh, New Hope Industries up there, which is essentially the same as our ATCO here. Um, and so again, it's just, it's, 
I'm a curious person. I like to see how other people do things and try to figure out how we can Im implant that here in the city of Athens. So that's who I'm going to be as the mayor of Athens, and I will continue to be as the mayor of Athens as I move forward. Um, I, I, um, <clears throat> I like to vision things. Um, I see things in certain ways. Um, I did when we explored putting those butt bins up on the, the uh, up and down Court Street, um, which has been a huge success story, uh, I believe. Um, it hasn't solved the cigarette butt problem, believe me, because there's still a lot of work to be done. But I can tell you that when we did a, a pre-scan before those butt bins went up, there was a count of over 8,000 cigarette butts up and down Court Street, down Richland Avenue, so and so. The, the, the scan was done during um, Athens Beautification Day, I think it was in 2014. Um, actually, no, it was 15. And we, I personally, <laughs> did the follow-up scan where I surveyed the same streets and everything and came up with 4,000 cigarette butts on the ground. It's still 4,000 cigarette butts, but I will tell you this. The majority of that 4,000 that I counted were in places where we, cigarette butt bins weren't installed, which was further down Richland Avenue, greatly reduced on Richland Avenue, so on, uh, on um, Court Street. Um, but, you know, I, I kid just kept thinking when we had this opportunity to write this grant and try and go after that money, that wouldn't it be grand if all of a sudden we didn't have butts on the street? Then I'm starting to think, well, how are we going to get gum up off the streets? Which is another thing that I do have a plan to tackle, and it could fit underneath this special improvement district uh, to where we could possibly create a job to where someone goes along with a steam wand is, and, you know, and is cleaning this stuff up, you know, uh, or partnering with some of our businesses. Um, I'm going to stop there. I've been going on for a half hour or so, which was a long intro, and letting you guys kind of into my head as to how I think things through, or at least what my goals are. Um, so if this is a good time, I think let's open it up for... I've got a microphone, so if someone wants to ask a question, make sure it's working. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm just wanted to ask, um, I kind of walk up and down the street of Georgetown with my cats at home here. And some of the rental are horrendous. What is the city going to do to get after these landlords to clean up their property? Now, I looked online today, and I was looking at, I think, the code, or city code, I guess it was called. And they talked about how grass needs to be cut if it's taller than eight inches. There's two houses on Con North Congress, 116 and 120. The grass has to be 18 inches. It's so tall that now it's just kind of like flopped over. So what can we do? Columbia, you can't even walk on. No one you know, does anything as far as uh, shoveling the, the snow or anything. And so when you talk about beautification, doesn't the rental, the property owners, the, the landlord that rented these students come under that? They do. For beautification, absolutely. Um, Here's my thoughts with code <clears throat> and code enforcement throughout these areas because it is an issue of, of getting in and uh, enforcing what is in code when it comes to properties and responsibilities of the landlords, of their tenants, of, of uh, a homeowner. Um, and, you know, I believe we just, we really need to have stronger enforcement of all the code. Uh, it, it shouldn't be, it, and it should be equal across the board. I guess what I'm getting at is one of the things I'm going to ask and require is of all of my code enforcement officers is there's no flavor of the day. You know, it's going to be, if you're driving somewhere um, and you look over and you see something, you stop even though you're, you're going to, you know, respond to something else. I think they And they need to see how deplorable some of these homes are. Yeah. Another thing, too, just to share with, with all of you, um, but to you, is that we do now have a new app. And Scott, please help me out. I just talked about it Athens earlier. City Athens City Source. To where you can actually use your iPhone or your, just use your phone and photograph that. And, it, and you know, it, it'll get tagged and sent to the appropriate department. Um, and it's queuable, you know, to where these items 
are stacked up and they need to be addressed. How long before they're actually addressed? Do you have a time limit? Because I keep hearing about all these landlords that are out of town or they have so many of them and they seem to be getting away with it. I don't know, I haven't lived in Hampton that long, but it seems like they're kind of like a good old boy letting people get away with some of these Not things. in my code, no. Okay. No. I, I hear you, but that's one of the changes that's going to happen. Okay. That there's whoever has <laughs> three uh, quick questions. Uh, the comments number one is I think there should be some uh, um, entity in the community that salutes certain people, like uh, Mr. Cromwell, for example. You know, he has his company that goes out with a high pressure cleaner uh, at least once a month, if not twice or three times a month. Cleaning all the gum and cigarette butts off of, uh, of uh, uh, Court Street, example. And there are other people in the community who do things like that as well. Uh, secondly, is the uh, press conference uh, yesterday that you gave, uh, and you mentioned about the uh, apps and being able to sign on mm -hmm. and take photos, is I would hope that uh, as many, many more people get into it, for example, I'm sending one in on Kinley Avenue, which is absolutely awful with. Uh, with holes and so forth. Which street was that? McKinley? McKinley. Yeah, and uh, it's over by South Green. Uh, there's a lot of residents over in that area, and particularly students. Uh, and uh, several of them ended up with flat tires, what have you. And, uh, during a rainy, snowy weather, people get splashed because there's a lot of students who walk there. Anyway, uh, the, as the line gets bigger and bigger, forwarded on to your different departments, road works, what have you, that they're able to maintain a semblance of getting things done. Otherwise, I'm afraid people frustrated that, gee, we did it, but nothing ever happened to this area. So, and the uh, uh, third thing is with the buses, the city of Athens and the county's bus system is tremendous. I have the highest uh, 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 compliments to you, having lived in other cities in this country. Tremendous system, and yet I would tell you 95% of the Ohio University students, and frankly faculty, are not even aware of the regularity yeah. and incredible wonderfulness of the buses that were purchased recently and so forth. Hopefully you can really get that out and about. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm glad you brought up the current transportation. I would be remiss to not say that, you know, former Mayor Weil, he led that charge hard. You know, he, that was one of his key things. And I'm continuing that, you know, to carry that torch forward because I know the value in it with transportation. Um, uh, so thank you. Um, you know, it's a great point. It's, it is a good system. There's also, correct me if I'm wrong, the double loop. There's a there's an app associated with that. Double map. Double something. Double map where you can sit there and figure out where the bus is so that you don't have to sit there and wander down and wait in a shelter or whatever, not knowing when the next one's going to come by. So you can literally track when those buses are, are coming. So. I compliment my chief often. <laughs> um, no, and I've sat as, as chair for almost four years, I think, on the Joint Police Advisory Council, which is also um, a great tool um, that is, advises the mayor and advises the president, uh, you know, President McDavis on what's going on. But also the cool thing about JPAC is it helps inform, uh, not inform, it helps uh, guide both Chief Pyle and Chief Powers from OU on things, you know, different ways of doing things. And not everything sticks, but things, some things have. And one thing that I'm really proud of is the fact that, you know, I, <clears throat> I'm going to steal this from Chief Pyle for a minute, I mean, because he and I were just talking about this and talking about redemption. And, you know, students and anybody can sometimes truly just screw up once, you know, and, and can be remorseful for what has happened and so on and so forth. Things got out of control. And it's, it has to do with the, how, the nuisance party, you know, and one of the things that I did on council was strove to, and, other, and my colleagues on council, was to essentially, for your first offense, decriminalize 
your first defense because sometimes students just it, it made a bad decision and things got out of control. And once, you know, if you have a house and you have a house party and things got out of control, you know, it's hard as a, as a student to try and reel things back in. And next thing you know, someone calls it in and blah, blah, blah. And, and the, my point being is that your first offense now becomes civil. Um, but if you do it again, then it goes, you know, down the path of the second one being a criminal offense. And it, it, was, it, it started in JPAC. It actually started with two of our student ambassadors um, or, you know, um, uh, commission members, council members. Uh, an undergraduate and a graduate student who said, you know, can we do something different about this? As a matter of fact, I think one of them is in the audience today. Um, weren't you part of that conversation? Um, I'm glad to hear that there will be cleaner streets. And, um, and I think one of the issues needs to be how the trash collection is done because today walking, walking uptown along East State, there were... Um, trash cans littering the sidewalks and making it impossible to just stay on the sidewalk without physically moving them. Um, and snow removal is also a problem when we stayed, especially on um, the hill going up around the bend past where the Athens bookstore was. That fraternity never shovels their, the sidewalk there. Um, I'm also concerned about areas that are not necessarily right in front of houses that can be targeted for enforcement along the cemetery, along uh, West State, um, our choir, Calliope sings um, at Arts West in the spring, and it's just after move out, and that whole stretch is so embarrassing for people to have to walk along um, West State up to Arts West. So I think it's basically city enforcement of um, other than just the landlord responsibility needs to Anymore. Thanks, Heather. Yeah, I agree. I mean, one of the things that, that I, I, it's not that I've been struggling with it, it's just something I keep harping on is snow removal. Um, and unfortunately, I think a lot of individuals have kind of gotten into the mindset that, well, it'll melt tomorrow and go away. No, I know. And it's, it's a citable offense. I mean, you, you can be cited within four hour or four hours after the snowstorm has stopped and to get out there and start removing your snow and you can be cited. Say again? 300 went out. But I, it needs to be more. The thing that troubled me a lot this past weekend, um, let me, before I get into what troubled me, I do have to give props to uh, a huge, huge thank you to our city workers who were out there and correct me if I'm wrong, it was five salt trucks and one snow plow, one, one truck with a plow that were out 24-7, I shouldn't say 24-7, it wasn't seven days, they were out there 24 hours around the clock sitting there working to get that snow off of the city streets, um, but it didn't alleviate the sidewalk problem that you're referring to because that's on the owners uh, and the residents and, and, and um, it's gonna be stronger citation that goes out. That's what it's gonna have to be. We have to break that culture down. For me, it's a disabilities issue too. You know, I look at that and if you read through ADA, ADA speaks to that very clearly in terms of not just shoveling your sidewalk to where for you, for me, um, I'm a what's called a tab. I don't know if anybody here has heard that term before, but I'm temporarily able-bodied. Most of us are. At some point, we're going to have something that, that impedes our ability to ambulate around through our environment. But don't do just a 12-inch shovel path down your side of the sidewalk. It, it's, it needs to be the, it's the entire sidewalk that's your responsibility. We can do better, Heather. You know, it's, and I really want to put the pressure on our businesses. Some of our businesses on East State Street own the, the lion's share of the, that property that, that has sidewalks that needs to be cleared. Um, again, they're susceptible to citation as well. You know, unfortunately, they can absorb sometimes that citation is going, oh, well, okay. infrastructure on Northwood. We have had our water pipes replaced only where the joke, so the, the joke is that eventually the whole thing will be replaced at this point because it's 
in front of my house, uh, it's now broken down twice, and it will be in a period of uh, 15 years. It's a good question. I used to live on Briarwood when I first moved here. Um, and I'm going to let my city engineer speak a little bit to this, but that's a that is such an interesting ridge um, along not only there, but you know to some degree Cable Lane, but but in particular Northwood and Briarwood as well. Um, with that whole that topography, um, it's it's a ridge top as you know, um, and I, I I am aware that there's been a number of fixes, but I'm going to ask my city engineer to speak to that for you because I. I know some of the details, but I don't know enough to. Sure. So there's a six-year uh, capital improvement plan. It's a rolling plan, um, and we've identified really over the next six years about fifty-eight million dollars worth of work. Now, as far as the revenue, I mean, the city to be able to do fifty-eight million dollars worth of work, it's just not there. So we have to search for outside funding sources, partner with those outside funding sources to pull that in and do those repairs. Uh, the city of Adams has about six hundred thousand feet of water. Over the last several years, we've replaced anywhere between 3,000 and 5,000 a year. So, uh, you do the math, in about 100 years, I've replaced all of the, all of the water main in the city. Now, we've been, we've been getting after it. Um, Branson, Harris, McGuffey, Jones Hill, Harris, Riverview, um, are all some neighborhood water lines we've done uh, recently. Uh, uh, one uh, last year that uh, Elizabeth, we did last year, one at the Athens Mall uh, that broke probably three or four times a year, replaced that. Um, a water line off of uh, South Blackburn and replaced that in the last couple of years. We replaced one of the two mains on Dixon Avenue. Um, so, yeah, water lines break. Um, the water line infrastructure started going into the city about uh, 1930, uh, thereabouts, and so there's quite a few of the lines in the city uh, from that era. So, especially the, the larger transmission lines, you know, parts of the lines. Just to come to the old building, so you have uh, some newer lines that went in. Um, that for whatever reason fail soon to be some of the lines that, that, that go in this area. So uh, to your point, um, eventually it will all be fixed, right? Because you go in and you put those stainless steel clamps on there when it breaks. Um, yeah, um, that's a that's a challenge uh, that we know, and, and you know it's it's really an exercise in, in uh, uh, determining um, where you're going to get the most bang for the buck for the amount of money that, that you uh, want to put into a water. Absolutely, absolutely. If you're interested, it's a six-year capital improvement plan. I can share it. Yeah, uh, the water crew, those are, those are some, some, some pretty amazing folks uh, who get out there from the zero degree uh, and get down in a hole full of water. Um, it's uh, two in the morning, it's definitely a, a good group of people. And it's cold water. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I came out today, but it wasn't one of the options. I do have a question. I heard from the city administration that you're thinking about having to direct. I would. I'm glad you asked that question. Um, <clears throat> as a lot of you know, there's been this struggle, you know, back and forth and back and forth. And when it comes to, came to the city's pool, um, the levy, you know, calls for a new pool. Um, you know, early on, I was really thinking. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had both an indoor and an outdoor pool until I, we really started learning more and more about costs associated with that and, and really for the pool levy, what could come in for the, for the pool? How much money could we really allocate to the pool and still get, um, again, accessibility elements throughout the city parks, maintain this, this building and, and the parks? Um, a lot of repairs, a lot of deferred maintenance we need to get ahead of that's taken place. So anyway, getting back to your point, as I've been thinking about this more and more, I did a little bit of research and um, realized that a therapy pool, an 80 or 90 degree therapy pool um, of considerable size as a therapy pool um, would cost with enclosure, with proper deck space and whatnot around it, um, and with all the pumps and so on and so forth, about $600,000. It's still a lot of money. But when we're looking at the price tag of what it would be for a 
competition indoor pool and our outdoor pool and everything else, the, the, the money's just not there. It's not, you know, and that, that it could be construed as unfortunate or whatever with the levy, the language of the levy and what was planned when, when we, me on council, when we were working on this and putting it through, uh, thinking about things anyway. Um, I believe an indoor therapy pool is probably the right way to go, you know, at a cost, a price tag that isn't, um, you know, at the 3 million level or 3.3 .3 million level or whatever. Um, and I've often thought to kind of give you guys some scope, um, what I've come up with, or what I've found is a 36 by 24 foot, 90 degree tank of water to give you some perspective. It's about from this wall to that one and from there to there. It's a sizable tank of water um, to where you could do water aerobics. Um, it could be a purely a therapy pool. Yeah, another possibility would be to put in three, maybe four of those endless pools. So you could have separate things going on um, within an enclosed environment. Um, for me personally, I've actually even thought, you know, within, you know, activity room A is the, the first one down there, you know, which is 46 by 44 feet or something like that. Where is Rich? Thank you, 45 by 42. Rich and I were just measuring it the other day. Uh, oh, he saw me pacing it off, and he goes, I can tell you what it is. Um, so, thank you, because I wear a size 11 shoe, and I have to make correction for, in terms of length. Anyway, um, and I kept thinking, you know, what if it were plopped right inside this space, you know, being activity room A? So I, I'm, we're exploring a number of different things, but therapy pool, I'm a huge fan of a therapy pool. Um, is it fiscally responsible? I think it is. I think it's a good alternative to what we could put in here at the community center and make happen. You know, whether we end up having to attach it to the, this building or it could be built into this building, you know, a lot to be planned. And I think, I don't know, because I'm not an engineer nor am I a, a contractor, but I would imagine that a 36 by 24 foot tank is going to take a shorter, have a shorter build time frame than something that is you know, the size of our current pool to replace it, which, but who knows? So that's the long answer to your question is, um, I'm serious about looking into having a therapy pool. Oh, Mayor Patterson, congratulations on the win. <laughs> Thank you, it was hard fought. <laughs> uh, but uh, I only have one question, and that's, uh, do you drive or do you walk the sidewalks? When I'm in the office, I walk the sidewalks. Um, when, <clears throat> before Richland Avenue South was repaired and we had the complete transformation, um, I did used to walk that a lot and I was one of those squeaky wheels saying, can we do something about this? Um, I have walked I'm not going to say all, Andy helped me out, is it 196 one-way streets, miles, no, not streets, 194, I was close, 194 miles of one-way streets uh, in the city of Athens. I have walked a lot of those uh, on my three campaigns, even when I did, wasn't, I had nobody running against me on this, I walked before the primary going door to door, and then I did my follow-up before the general, so I, yeah, my answer to your question is, I have seen our city sidewalks. Yeah. I, I was just, I was that because we need a mayor who drives the streets and, and understands how bad the shape is. Well, I do both. Uh, sidewalks, um, I think that we've made some, some great improvements in some of our sidewalks and again that came about not because of me but I, my eyes were really opened up by the campaigning going door to door and walking the city streets but also serving on the, the Commission Disabilities. Um, and, and knowing that I have to look at the sidewalks through a different lens, um, you know, again, uh, through the uh, engineering and public works, you know, um, looking at and assessing sidewalks, um, South May has had a lot of repairs taken place. Um, uh, so has uh, Central Avenue, you know, a number of areas, and we're gonna continually tra target a lot of these streets to make sure that we can, can start upgrading not just the streets, but the sidewalks as well. But everything's being tracked. And again, I've got a great EPW. I really do. I'm Carol Shaw. Hi, Carol. Right? Sure. <laughs> I'm well, Carol. Um, 
anyhow, um, in talking about the street, one of the attractions in Hampton is the Philip the Great Street. Mm -hmm. And all of them are horrible. Um, I drive the streets of Athens all the time, every day. And my car just bumps along and it's not going to break and not going to break at all. And I just, I feel that if we're going to repair a brick street in Athens, we should do it correctly. You know, not repair it so that a year later there's big dips all over the other streets. I just, I feel that something very important that really enhanced the town. Because no matter where you go on the brick roads, they're horrible. And even the, the streets that are not brick um, are in bad shape. And, 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 and another problem I have is uh, Madison Avenue. Uh, I feel that it's just an accident waiting to happen. I see so many people that come from the right side of town that want to come into town. They're going to repair it, they're going to have a stroller. And I mean, I just, I just feel there should be some type of walkway in the town. On Madison? I just, I don't know. I don't know why there is. I know there is in Hampton Town, but I think if somebody was creative, they could have come up with something so we have a better access to make that a place for us to walk. Okay. So those are just some of my thoughts. Thank you. I know with Madison in particular, we did look at safe routes to schools as a possibility, but that's all based on the number of of, of students who use, you know, use certain byways to get around and so on and so forth. And if, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I think that it, when they did the assessment of Madison, either up on uh, Columbia or elsewhere coming into it, that the numbers weren't there for us to go and, and uh, look into grant funding through that mechanism. Um, but, you know, Madison's is a challenge. It's a crazy st steep street. My first year here, just a real quick story, was, you know, that winter, it was a winter of 99, I, 98, 99 is when I came here, was when we had, in 24 hours, had some 24 inches of snow, and they closed Richland, or sorry, closed Madison. I lived up on Briarwood. That was the coolest sledding hill. <laughs> they also had it roped off, by the way. <laughs> Rosemary? If you don't, if you don't watch it, you're, you're gonna, you're gonna, someone's going to hit that, and you're going to trip. And that could be so eliminated. It's just a matter of cutting off the, the part that comes out like this and making it just like, it's, uh, yeah, I think that, uh, I, I, I do the drive, the drive this all the time, and I don't know if I've ever, but I've seen people clean up the street in Madison. I've worked here for since 19, or since 2003, and nobody has ever said that to me before, so I'll go look at it. <laughs> I said, I've worked here since 2003, and nobody has ever brought that particular issue to me before, so I'll go check it out. Absolutely. 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 Um, I have the minor mom, which is a bad thing for all of us. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, Susan, I'm take that away from her. The young and annoying news again. So um, I wanted to ask you recently, actually today, we had that report of a serial sexual assault mm -hmm. in Memory. Mm -hmm. I know that's a police investigation and that's largely going to be who deals with it, but what do you think the city's role in as far as that goes and as far as the community's role in safety, where that goes, and, and knowing that's around and trying to keep that from uh, infiltrating the community? The, our role is, is inform, inform, inform as well as getting the word out about safety, what are, what are things you can do, you know, if you're out in the evenings, you know, don't walk alone, you know, walk in groups. And, but this is, there's a, a, a lot of information that's coming out. Uh, you know, Chief Pyle had a, a press release, which you're, you, yeah, that's what you're referring to earlier today, getting that out there. The other thing, and I was actually, uh, had a, a phone conversation with Chief Pyle earlier, and, um, you know, we've got to bring every possible resource to bear on investigating what, who, you know, finding this person. I'm not going to use the words I used with the chief. Wouldn't be right. But it's like, we've got to, we've got to get this person. We have to find them, you know, pull out the stops. Uh, um, but, uh, you know, again, with the, the relationship that we have, 
again, not only under the MOU, but just the relationship that Chief Pyle and Chief uh, Powers have together, that they're working at, you know, we're working things, getting state level involved, um, actually, you know, exploring federal level as well. So we've got, you know, every resource uh, we can muster and, and then some to, to address this. But the big thing is, is having a campaign, an informational campaign of, you know, the do's and don'ts, um, you know, to inform. And OU is doing the same thing. Ohio University is, is heavily campaigning this as well in an informational blitz. Um, I don't know if, if Chief Pyle wants to add anything to that or not. I think you, you hit the salient points dead on. It's, it's all about what the community can do. Uh, and, and really it's about being an upstander, which is a, a term given to the people who are, instead of being bystanders, you're upstanding bystanders. And you get involved and you help. And uh, you help one another, you look out for each other, and, and you come together as a community to help solve this. Because that's what we're going to need information from the community, uh, and we're going to need resources from the taxpayers, uh, free with money, uh, to, to uh, all the different schools of surveillance and the different analyzations of it that need to take place, or analyses that need to take place on this, uh, on this uh, profile, this suspect. And that's going to cost some money. Uh, but the mayor uh, pledged to me this morning that we'll, we'll pull out all the stops and we'll, we'll do everything we can to bring all the resources to bear, uh, both locally and at the state level. There's another question. I first wanted to compliment Athens Public Transit on uh, Route 6. Um, it was an issue for graduate students sent a few years back as we discovered there's a large number of grad students living out in the country so it makes a lot cheaper. And Route 6 not only delivers transit to the folks who came through, it also triples service now and only instead of eight stops a day, it's 24 stops a day. So we're very excited about that. Good. Um, but I feel like there's opportunities to keep momentum going. And so right now I feel like there's a, a strong opportunity to uh, form a partnership with the university. Uh, right now if you're a student on campus and you can't decide between a, a year parking pass or a year bus permit or how much money you need, uh, the cost for a year bus pass is 140 bucks. But the only place you can get it is at the office, the mayor's office, and then the paid for it in cash. And <laughs> Not to me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're considering purchasing the, uh, you know, the parking permit, um, you, can, you can do it online from your home and, uh, or go into uh, parking services. And it, uh, it's slightly cheaper. You do not have to pay for it in cash. You can charge it to your student account, pay for it like six months later. And it's, um, it's incredibly convenient. So I think small steps Interesting. out there to start making the sustainable decision. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, you know, there's some real opportunities for, for the city to partner with the university. That's interesting. Sure. Sure. Um, you know, I have to give a lot of credit to Michael Lockman, um, again, from Athens Public Transit. Um, you know, I, if he's not thinking in those ways, uh, but I think he is, he is, yeah, I figured as much. He's a smart guy. Um, I'm glad to hear you talking about you know Route Six and and, and what that's how that's impacted the planes in a positive way. Um, I I mentioned a minute ago you know talking about extending that or having a, a new route that goes all the way to to Nelsonville. Um, part of that exploration is also partnering with Hawking College. Um, you know, getting Hawking College on board because I know Hawking would like to have something that not just comes from. Nelsonville to Athens, but actually goes out to Albany to Lake Snowden, which is their property, and and you know on some level, but I think you know, I think big sometimes. But let's let's get tackle Nelsonville to Athens first, and getting that established. But uh, um, I agree with you in terms of partnerships, getting others, you know, and and I'm all about partnering. You know, that's that's part of who I am. Um, again, I, I, just to go back and touch real quick, and I hopefully I answered. Um, you know, the therapy pool, you know, I've been in conversations with Ohio Health uh, because I think there's a, a, a possibility for a partnership with the therapy pool here in, on the Athens, or the community center campus, uh, which would serve Ohio Health as well. Um, so, yeah. Heather?
I'm fine with doing that. Yeah. I'd be happy to do that. I served for a year, maybe two, on the um, the bike path committee. Yeah, yeah. And I know they struggled with it then, you know, trying to figure out how to make this work. But their, you know, their span of influence isn't the strongest. But I will certainly, absolutely. Joni? Charter city, you could have amongst many other things uh, uh, faster enforcement of some of the issues that we're having with the bike uh, and many other things. So I guess I'm closing up, but have you thought about that? I know it's a lot of work, but. Um, you know, <laughs> I've, I haven't thought about it deeply. I have thought about it. <laughs> you know, I've not gotten to the nitty gritty in terms of, of you know, what you're freed up to do as a charter versus statutory. Um, I mean, I'm well aware of, of what they are. Um, as a matter of fact, when I was up, that's, that was like the question number two when I was up in Mansfield um, talking to the mayor. First question was, are you a strong mayor? You know, are you a full-time mayor or part-time? Second was, are you statutory or charter? Um, yeah, for whatever weird reason. Uh, you know, it's, it is worth exploring and looking into. Um, it would take a lot of council action for something along those lines, I believe. But you know, at this point, Joni, there's, you know, I'm focusing on a couple things at this point in time. One of them is is the comprehensive plan, reengaging the task force. Again, uh, again, city planner and I have had these conversations. We're in year 13 or 14 of the current comprehensive plan, um, and we, we don't need to wait until year 18 or 19 to sit there and go, oops, we, I think we should probably think about what the next 20 years is, what's important, what's not. That's number one. Another one is a task force to look at the community center campus in its totality. Um, with you know the pool, with uh, East State Street uh, improvements that are going to be taking place uh, at the interchange. There's a lot of things going on uh, when it comes to that. Uh, you know, Armory has. I've, I've got a task force. We're going to be moving that forward. So, give me time. I mean, it's yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. I didn't mean to bombard you with all the different task forces, but there's a lot of things that that we're trying to hit. Uh, there'll likely be a task force. Um, looking into a special improvement district in the uptown area. So, yeah. Yes. Since you mentioned the comprehensive plan, um, I know and since I wrote it today that the comprehensive plan that's now in place talks about the R1 districts and the pensions and what they contribute to the town mm -hmm. and to the residents and those around. And since you were going to consider <laughs> okay, since you talked about the comprehensive plan, um, I'm concerned about this. I know that it's old. I know that you have gone to the Commission to speak to us. Okay. Those areas, no gentrity, residential areas, where the 
the film he was working on. Now, as he reviewed it for 20 years, he uh, probably didn't make any changes. Obviously, he wasn't doing it, and he can't make the same film thing for that David. So what I would like to suggest is that you would lay any decisions about editing Ruth until he has done that review and see how you now think about those movies, their value to their residents and to the town, and what is making serious Roman changes that will have, I think, dramatic effects before you actually institute a president. Thank you. Thank you. To, with the comprehensive plan, you know, and again, this has been talked about uh, between the city planner and myself is, you know, as we start looking at the comprehensive plan, and you mentioned a minute, a minute ago the changes, you know, we really don't know what those changes will be, obviously. But the first thing that we need to do is, since we are year 14 in, what have we accomplished? You know, let's, let's treat this as a punch list and go, okay, what have we, what have we accomplished? What on that plan haven't we accomplished? And more importantly, with the ones that haven't been, you know, why haven't we accomplished them? You know, are there things that we need, that we, at this point in time, we can learn from that maybe it became too onerous 10 years ago and it just kind of got pushed off to the side and, and, uh, or whatever, but we need to kind of revet the things that, that haven't been accomplished yet. And then also, again, like I said, explore what will our environment look like, you know, 20 years from now. I went through a really interesting process not too long ago where um, it was this kind of visioning process where you sit there and go, you, you, you know, how do you see things 35 years from now? And I'm sitting there going, my gosh, you know, hopefully I'm not in a box, but who knows? Um, but you work your way back and then you go to 25 years, then you go to 15 years, then you go to 10 and so on five to try and break it down into smaller chunks. And I kind of view the comprehensive plan that way for the next 20 years out um, in terms of where we'll go. But I, I appreciate your input on thinking things through, and in particular with Airbnbs. Um, I'll be transparent as as I can. I've stayed at about roughly eight Airbnbs, um, and um, some of them have been really lovely experiences. In particular, the owner-occupied experiences that I've had. My wife and I have stayed at a number of them together. Um, the less pleasant experiences for me personally were the non-owner occupied, uh, but that's that's my chief concern about th that the whole Airbnb process, um, and I'm worried about housing stock too. Quite honestly. Right. Right. Thank you. Well, I, I want to second this statement because I also live in an R1 neighborhood. Now, my neighborhood has adequate parking, so it probably could have an Airbnb in my particular neighborhood, which is the far east side. But I know enough people who live in the inner side who, who realize that parking is an incredible problem. And I don't know whether the eight Airbnbs that you stayed in have all kept in in college town, mm -hmm. but there are endless and many, many long-term rentals, which at least we wrote a code that would sort of control, you know, occupancy, fire, all the hazards that come with rental property. And so I would at least second Mr. Powell that a quick decision on Airbnb, we all may come to regret. And I think there are more of us in our one neighborhood who really haven't followed this because it didn't seem to particularly apply. Maybe there are only one or two now operating, but there's the, the chance of a lot more, and I realize there are housing problems during student university events, but I still don't think that 
permits us to casually agree to something as dramatic as permitting Airbnbs mm -hmm. in residential neighborhoods, which we have very carefully protected in the past. Thank you. Did you stay in Talbot County? Oh, I did not. Yeah, not not one. It's, it's funny. I never really thought. I never thought about that. Yeah, it's but in New York no. City. And even New York is facing. Yeah. I grew up in New York. Even New York is facing problems. Yeah. Well, and like I said, when I was in, I agree with you. Nashville was struggling with it. They came up with some creative solutions, but they're struggling with it. And their city council was struggling with it. Hey, Steve. Hey, Connor. Connor. Yeah. I was wondering. If you could explain a little more about what this special agreement district is in the Uptown area and uh, what it could be exactly and how it could be accomplished too. <laughs> sure. Um, a special improvement district or a SID um, is permissible under Ohio Revised Code. Um, it, it speaks directly to um, SIDs and defines them, what they are, and how the, the process. In a nutshell, though, a SID is an area, a defined area. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a downtown area or an uptown area in our, in our world, um, but that's how I envision this if it moves forward. And you have two ways. It's essentially a, a tax. It's essentially a tax on the uh, property owners within a specified area. Um, and you have to have 60% uh, agreement, you know, an affirmative uh, letter um, supporting such a, uh, such a SID from 60% of if you use the linear footage way to assess. Another way to do it is you have to have 75% approval just based upon property ownership, um, which is interesting. Uh, and then once it's done, you have to have a nonprofit that is a, a C3. Um, or I believe a C6, but it has to be a 501, who is then the, the um, fiscal agent, basically. Uh, and the, the property owners up and down defined area also kind of vote on the, the things that are going to unfold with, un, with this. You know? So I don't know, if, if we want to bring hanging baskets of flowers back up onto Court Street again, which I personally think would be pretty cool, or we want to change the lamp posts from the ones we have to the black ones that you've seen on Richland Avenue, which I personally really like. Um, and so if that's what they want within that defined prescribed area, they would sit there and say, yep, this would be great, let's vote on this, okay. And then it's done, and, and you use then the funding that comes from through um, uh, those taxable entities in that area. Um, the city of Buckhead, um, which is really a suburb of Atlanta, um, not too long ago, you know, had something like this transpire, um, and they used a three mil um, levy basically for the businesses in that area, and it completely, re, you know, re you know, it, it reinvigorated that whole um, area within Atlanta. It's been done in Cleveland. It's been done uh, in Columbus. Uh, Columbus has done a, a couple of them. Um, uh, I'm going to kind of reach out to Paul Logue at this point because you sent me that a number of places. But uh, other cities in Ohio that have done this that you, that you remember? Yeah, they're, um, uh, where's Connor? Right there. All of the money that is uh, created through that special assessment will be used up at that end of that district. Uh, it can be used for public improvements. It can be used for uh, infrastructure. They can use that money to either ensure that the property owners can do uh, uh, historic preservation work or facade improvements. Uh, the bonus will be used uh, in the Capitol Square area to, um, to hire people to clean the sidewalks, to provide some information to the court, to do signage for parking and things like that. So it's a very common basic uh, strategy that's used to get an influx of uh, investment into that town that is dominant. Yeah. Thank you. You mentioned the C4, but is it given in the 
No. It's really, I believe, it's at the property owner's decision as to how much of a concession they want to take. And then uh, there's, there's a percentage that they can take. You know, when I mentioned earlier, you know, the idea of putting conduit and possibly fiber optics, you know, if there were, if this were to happen, and part of it were, you know, sidewalk replacements or improvements, and to run conduit and fiber optic, you know, I often think how cool would that be to where we can sit there and split off pairs to businesses that are up and down the Richland or the um, uptown corridor uh, on Court Street or whatever, you know, to enhance connectivity as well. Hey, um, thanks for coming and having this meeting oh. today. It's awesome <laughs> to uh, see you, and I really liked your story about your love at first sight when you came to Athens first on the highway by the river, because I had exactly the same experience, and I'm glad to know that we have a mayor who loves the town as much as I do. Um, I've got a lot of stuff that I like to think about, but there's three main things that I want to focus on today. Um, first has to do with the fact that I like to produce a lot of my own food. I like to grow gardens. And I heard that until just a few years ago, it was actually illegal to have a vegetable garden in your front yard in Athens. And um, I might be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure that it was true. It's, um, it was true. And so um, I moved here about five years ago, so I think that that change happened before I showed up. But it's really awesome that it did happen because <coughs> I've had a lot of front yard vegetable gardens, made a lot of food for myself, and made a lot of food for my friends and family. Um, and one thing that um, is still outstanding that's in relation to that is chickens. I remember there was a discussion about um, re-legalizing chickens when, um, a couple years after I moved here, but then it kind of faded away and nobody really talked about it. Um, but I'm really interested in being able to have some chickens in my yard because I like to eat eggs sometimes, but it's like the one thing that I can't just have grown in my yard. Um, so chickens is the first thing that I'd like to think about. The next one is landlords. This wasn't on my list when I came, but um, I noticed that I'm much younger than a lot of the folks here. I've only lived in town for about five years, but in that time I've rented five houses, so I've had a lot of experience on the other side of the unmowed lawn. Um, and I just wanted to um, tell a couple stories about like a couple times when there have been inspectors in my house, and I pointed out violations that I knew were against the city code to the city inspector, he ignored them and they never got fixed. Um, a lot of rentals in this town are run down and in an illegal state of repair with stuff like unsafe electricity that could cause fires or electrocution, leaking roofs, and dangerous mold that can release toxins. I actually had a friend who's in a, um, she's in a situation right now where she's trying to have a landlord help her pay for medical expenses for a, um, paralysis that happened in her arm due to some mold toxins that were in the house when she was telling the landlord that there was a mold problem and it didn't get fixed. She ended up having to move out and a bunch of medical expenses. Um, so I've seen a lot of landlords um, and a lot of um, city inspectors not really doing their job. And one thing that I thought was really funny was when the landlord was going around to different properties that he owned with the same inspector in the same day, and while they were at my house, they were discussing plans to go have lunch together. So it was like the landlord and the inspector who were supposed to be enforcing it were friends with each other. And I, who was supposed to be in the house that was kept safe, was just ignored. Um, so chickens, landlords, and the third thing that I'd like to think about today is a towing ordinance that I noticed in Athens City Code. It was from about 2002 that limits the um, charge for towing in town to $50 charge from the towing company. I had a friend who got her car towed in front of my house the day before Thanksgiving around like 4 o'clock p.m., which technically was illegal to park there, but we weren't thinking about it because it was a holiday. And she ended up having to pay over $100 between the city fee and the towing company's fee. And so I was just curious, since it's in front of my house, I didn't want to, I wanted to figure out what the laws were for parking there and what I was doing. So I found this ordinance from 2002 that said that, um, the, the, said that the towing company could charge a maximum of $50. And then I called some people and asked, and I found out that there was actually PUCO, the Public Utilities Commissions of Ohio, was created in, I think, 2004. And they were granted the authority to um, basically override all of the stuff that um, a local municipality decides and come up with their own regulations and fee schedules. And so their fee schedule said $90 for that thing that Athens had in the ordinance for $50. But they, um, 
the Supreme Court of Ohio in 2014 said that the thing that says that PUCO overrides the local municipality is unconstitutional via the Ohio State Constitution. There's a part that says that cities can decide their own police and other regulations. And so the, um, the PUCO's $90 thing doesn't really apply anymore. But when I called and talked to the Athens Police Department, the Athens City Law Director, and all of the towing companies, none of them had ever heard of this, and they were all um, okay with the $90 still, and also the law director and police officer told me that it was not a criminal, but a civil matter, so there was nothing that we could do. And I was wondering if you had anything to say about chickens, landlords, etc. <laughs> <laughs> Can I bundle those together? Uh, <laughs> put the landlords in with some chickens and tow them away. Um, the towing issue, that I, I don't know how to answer that. Um, that's not my area. I don't know if Chief can address that at all or uh, not. I'm not aware of the 2014 Supreme Court decision. Uh, the law director spent a considerable amount of time with that issue. And so there's a law that was passed that was in 2004 that preempted municipality law and the state public health towing regulations in the hands of PUCO. This week just saw uh, another law passed in the state of Ohio dealing with Uber cab companies and uh, networkable ride companies or ride sharing companies. Now those laws were specifically designed to preempt municipality laws just like that uh, 2004 law that preempted the municipality towing law. So I'm not familiar with the 2014 case in front of me today. I will tell you though that the state continues to pass laws as of just this uh, November or, or December I still had to yeah, finish chickens or landlords. Um, it's interesting to hear what you said about the, the inspections and whatnot, and I will, I'll look into that. I, I don't have, there's no answer that I can give you right now about the experiences that you've had in the five places that you've lived, but um, I, will, I will explore that. As with chickens, I'm going to kind of back, pass the buck on the chicken issue. When I'm in terms of passing the buck, as a council member, um, it was something that came up through council a couple times. So, uh, being the consummate politician, I'm going to request that you reach out to your city council member in your ward and sit there and say, "Hey, I would like to have chickens in my yard," um, you know, and because you're talking legislative action. <laughs> on the, sorry, Chris, I <laughs> we opened that door. Um, Todd. As you know, we sat down two and a half weeks ago uh, <coughs> with me in the office regarding the lighting, regarding the pool specifically. Sure. And go around the room. I have brought to the table a firm that should be drinking in our. Used to use the high projections from the consultant instead as gospel and, and bases its decisions upon them that uh, what it includes, what it discounts. Basically, we're talking about a legacy project that's going to affect the county as well as the city, and even some, some great constituent or people in surrounding counties on the outskirts for the next 50 years for life of the pool. Got a consultant that says that we've got an aging demographic. We have people that are concerned about brain drain, people leaving the community because we don't have a lot of the amenities that some communities have, whether it be in retirement homes or health care for the ages. Or
whatever we might be in trouble for there. And, uh, and suss it out, dice it up, find out what the real numbers actually are, and, and come up. We would kind of get this elaborate thing you said, top scores for the best. Kind of like that with the target. Six hours later, city council meeting, order 02, or 002 uh, was introduced for its first reading. Eliminating the option of uh, moratorium and just, just rolling it over, calling it good. It didn't quite jive. It was a disappointing uh, option. The city now has in front of it at least a general understanding that there are options out there that are more cost effective than what we're going to provide an objective for us to actually work. Yes, that's the And what are the options that are there? And uh, so I would like to know just why would the city, why would the town spend and limit its options until it's absolutely necessary? And uh, the city may not have to spend five hundred thousand dollars in totality to develop those roads. And there's just other projects that could have happened that are available on a higher cost scale. So why would the city, if is your administration? Really going forward with 00216, is it want to move forward and eliminate the moratorium altogether? And what is the city, what is the mayor's plan to provide for the health, welfare, and safety? And it was an emergency ordinance when it was first passed in 2014. It was levied. What is the, what is the city's the city mayor's office going to do for health, safety, and welfare of the regional community? Because this is a city, a county city. Sure. Here's what I'm going to do I'm going to be fiscally responsible. Because when I look at those numbers again and again and again, that there, we can only spread this peanut butter so thin before we start. It's, it's not serving the citizens of Athens and beyond in a responsible way. It, it, you know, at the end of the day, and I mentioned this at council, and let me, let's rewind a second because I think my memory is a little bit different than yours. Um, I didn't bring up the idea of a task force. Um, you brought that forward and said, how about doing this? I never once said, I'm going to put forward a task force. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, what is fiscally responsible is to have a quality product of a swimming pool. The voices that, this, that uh, for me as a mayor and before as a city council member, um, the voices that we weren't he hearing are obviously the silent ones. Um, you know, for me, with my, and I'm not gauging anything on me, but, you know, with having two small children and the joy of them using an outdoor pool, you know, I have to keep that in the back of my mind, you know, and try to think, okay, how about all the other families that have small children or children or whatever, and thinking, what would this city look like if we had no outdoor pool? All we have is this nice, pretty, expensive indoor natatorium, and we have no outdoor features at all because you know it's not cost effective. Here's another thing that I had to weigh out, and this is good for everyone to hear. What I had to weigh out was the knowledge, which I didn't have as the levy was early, you know, first conceived and trying to figure things out, was the fact that our swimming pool is, as you all know, it's a seasonal pool. It's not a 24-7, 365 pool. It's a seasonal swimming pool. That comes with some interesting features associated with it. Those who you employ as your lifeguards are seasonal employees. Um, and, it, it, and that's a whole different thing as opposed to having to hire full-time staff. Once, once we go into the indoor pool realm, that indoor pool is now an undercover 365 pool that comes not only with the maintainers, but now comes with full-time lifeguards that I've got to sit there and pay. The, the, a lot of you know this, um, and for those of you who don't, my 100s, so that's, that's paying for salaries and benefits and, and everything when it comes to the employees. That is the lion's share of my budget. And now if I've got to hire a bunch of full-time staff, that what I would with an indoor facility, you know, that's where we're going to find ourselves running at a deficit, you know, as opposed to what we're afforded with our seasonal pool. 
the thing I have said with the seasonal, with, with, with going for an outdoor pool and, as you heard me earlier, like seriously exploring a therapy pool, an indoor tank of water that could be used, and in particular for, I think, our older adults and those living with disabilities, as well as those who are recovering from surgery or injury or whatever, I think the most prudent thing is to have something like that within this, you know, within the, the campus here somewhere. Um, is that the seasonal pool or, or outdoor pool and to replace our outdoor pool with another nice outdoor pool. And by the way, um, I, you know, we will have splash pads in some of our city parks too. So we start spreading the wealth around that don't cost the citizens anything to go and enjoy in a city park, pack your lunch, go sit down at Southside Park, have fun with your kids, and they can go run through this splash pad for anyone who's been to Easton. Easton has one um, that sits there in the middle and it's essentially a 735, and I know because I paste that off too, um, 735 foot splash, uh, square foot splash pad, um, and kids play in that thing all day long. But the other point I wanted to make is that if we are, and we are, going to be paying, you know, uh, multi-millions for replacing and putting a new outdoor pool. I've also tasked our, you know, our Arts, Parks and Rec director, you know, my director of Arts, Parks and Rec, that we extend the season in which we're swimming. You know, if you guys have all experienced our summers lately that, you know, it tends to be fairly nice and decent in May, the first day of May. Well, let's be open in May. Let's open swimming in May and close in October because that's the flip side. You know, these days, and I'm a, I believe in global warming. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. It's there. Uh, but our, you know, the, October is nice. You know, we should be, the pool should be open, you know, five months instead of three or whatever. So, Mr. Swinger, that's, that's my answer to your question. Um, there was no flipping on anything. It was me as the, as, you know, the chief executive for the city. I have to sit there and be fiscally responsible with these taxpayers' dollars and provide a product um, that is, you know, the best product possible, but also making sure that we have, are servicing all sectors of the city as well. And I believe this is the right plan. I, I really do. I believe this is the way to go. Um, and if you dare to differ, that's fine. I, I, I think we got to break this off. We, we said we would leave at 8 o'clock. We've been here an hour and a half. And I'm going to thank Mr. Swinger and Mr. Bennett for taking his evening. Uh, Mr. Sketching out his view of our city in the future and answering questions. And I also want to recognize your staff sitting right here in front of me because, well, nominally, they can get Thursday evenings off, so they yeah. all can. I want to thank all of you very, very much. I want to thank the audience for coming. Thank the late Lynn. Mary, you want to adjourn us? Uh, I have to rectify something I said. I misinformed uh, the group. Our candidate forum is going to be February 16th, not the 23rd, because one of the candidates could not be there on the 23rd, and he was a problem without both <coughs> So February 16th, Tuesday, February 16th at 6.30 at the Public Library, candidate forum. Could we, could we sneak in one more? He, okay, just ju just one more. Just one question. Here we come. Actually, to make comment, this is known as the uh, Benoit, which is the last chapter in a book. And last chapter this evening is that uh, I think we all are incredibly appreciative of living in a place called Athens, Ohio. And as I always say when I speak with Dave Palmer on the radio talk show, I end and say, thank goodness we have the opportunity to live in one of the best communities in the world considering what's going on. And there's always going to be fix-its, and there's always going to be items to improve, and so forth and so on. I think Athens, as many of the students that I uh, mentor at Ohio University uh, and grads and so forth always say, happiest day of our life was when we came to Athens and OU, saddest day of our life was when we left Athens and OU. We can't wait to get back. Everybody loves this place. AARP says this is one of the favorite places for people to look at when they're retiring. They just need a place to live. So congratulations to every one of you for a wonderful community. We all thank you for it.